Hello and welcome to ABP Live. I have with me today the Ambassador of Israel to India, Mr. Naur Gilon. He is going to talk to us about the ongoing crisis and where is it and if at all there is a solution. Welcome to ABP Live, Ambassador, and thank you for giving us your time. I know it's a very difficult time for you. Uh, but just to understand, how do you situ see the situation right now? You've seen the overwhelming support that you know Indians are giving, including Prime Minister Narendra Modi. What is it that you have to say to our viewers? First of all, I think I would start with the event uh, last Saturday, 7th, October 7th, which was not another, you know, we live in violence in Israel from day one. This was something in a different magnitude. This was not their organization. This was ISIS. The kind of operation, the brutality, also the numbers, of course. So we are speaking of 1,400 deaths. We are speaking of more than uh, 200 kidnapped kidnapped, we don't know exactly, uh, more than 3,000 wounded, uh, so far 6,500 uh, uh, rockets or, or more shot at Israel. I, my wife and my fo four kids who are grown up already and my five grandchildren, they're all in Israel, so they go to shelter. It's not, uh, uh, we are used to it, but it's not a simple life. And you know, this reality that uh, ISIS kind of terrorists cross the border and storm 30 uh, Jewish communities and slaughter men, women, children, babies, cruelty, beheading, rape, whatever, killing children in front of their parents. This is something we never knew. So it's not another attack in a series of violence or something like that. This is a game changer. And I think that also the reaction of Israel is going to be a game changer in the sense that we are going to uh, stop sh nothing short of depriving Hamas, ISIS guys, of being able to execute anything similar in that magnitude in the coming in the coming future. So it's going to be different. But when it comes to India, you know, I have been a veteran diplomat, thirty more than thirty years. I've been ambassador in three countries, um, stationed in many more friendly countries. All of them, never have I met such wide support as I saw here in India. It's really amazing and and. Uh, really emotional for me. It started, as you said, with Prime Minister Modi ji, who already on Saturday afternoon of the of the attack, when the full magnitude was not there yet, we didn't understand how big it is. I think then we were discussing tens of dead on the Israeli side, not 1,400 plus. Uh, he came out with a very strong condemnation to terrorism and a, a voice of support to Israel. Uh, but it didn't stop there. I got phone calls from ministers, from high officials, from military people, from high, uh, businessmen, and everyone really huge support. And then you go to the media, social media, social media. We were we were stormed with love and with support. Really, something unprecedented, and it gives us again. Israel wants to fight. Traditionally, we always fight our wars by ourselves because this is part of the. Uh, you know, the deterrence to an, they should know that we are able, we don't need anyone. We will fight and we will win. That's what we did so far. So we don't need physical support of soldiers coming, although I had many people in India wanting to come and volunteer. We need the moral support the, to know that the world is with us and will give us the opportunity to do what we need to do. Mm -hmm. Well, Ambassador, as you rightly yeah. said, that probably this is going to be the game changer and uh, the world recognizes the fact, including India, that this is not just yet another uh, violent attack. This is this is unprecedented, right? Um, at the same time, there are these questions coming up that while you try to eliminate Hamas, uh, what is this kind of, you know, the kind of human catastrophe that UNWHO is talking about? And the fact that 1.1 million innocent Gazans are, you know, asked to go to South. That situation, how do you think, will shape up eventually? Yeah. Uh, first of all, you know, we also have a very unique situation where, thinking of a humanitarian, we have all these hostages, uh, 200 people from the ages of 9 months to almost 90 years old. And uh, we also think of them and their situation. But coming back to Gaza, I think that the people who are taking care of Gaza, of Gaza, of the people of Gaza who really give attention and to their situation is Israel, not uh, Hamas. Hamas traditionally, for a very long, for all, all along the years, I think, has been using the the population as human shields. They were shooting from uh, hospitals, from schools, uh, from mosques, hoping that we will shoot back. 
kill innocent civilians, and then there will be pressure on Israel to stop, because they know that they can cannot compete with us. And even this, you're speaking of the one million people or so who we were asked to move south. Why, why did we ask them? Because they didn't, we, we knew that we are, we are going to come in with very strong force. We didn't want them to be caught in crossfires there. And Hamas was putting pressure on them not to move. They were putting roadblocks. They were threatening people. We have evidence. Uh, we put it also on social media. It's there. So Hamas doesn't care about the people. Look, the leadership of one of the first steps we did, we uh, went to the villa neighborhood, the most exclusive neighborhood, where all the Hamas leaders live, and we told everyone to evacuate the, the, the place, and we brought down the villas, because they are living a very good life, those living inside, in villas, in very com in comfort, while the, some of their leaders are living in Qatar and in Turkey and other places, in luxury places, they don't care about the people. They don't care about the suffering of the people. Now, there is no way that we can eliminate Hamas. And we, the Prime Minister defined two targets to, the, uh, to this operation, to the military, to the IDF. He said one, of course, is to eliminate the capacity of Hamas, and the second one is, is the releasing of the hostages. There is no chance you can do it from the air. You must go on a ground operation to achieve these targets. So we will have to go there. We are trying to minimize the hurt. We are trying, we, are, we already renewed water supply. Uh, there are discussions of doing uh, also some supplies, uh, humanitarian supplies from through Egypt. So it's, it's discussed there. We are not blind to this. But what is the alternative? That the people will stay in their homes and they will be dying in crossfire. I don't think it's a good solution for everyone. I will mention maybe one figure that people are not aware of. About one, half a million of Israelis already left their houses, both in Gaza and in the northern front that we can speak about, uh, on the request of the government in order to um, put them in safer, safer place in Israel, uh, in order not to have them caught in the fire. So yeah, there is, when you have war, and Hamas declared war in Israel, this is war. But I mean, Will you be allowing mm. the humanitarian aid to come in? There are discussions. Uh, it will be, I think, uh, it has to be also addressing our humanitarian concerns about, uh, uh, about uh, hostages and everything. We will try to make sure that there is no crisis. I will tell you that even by international law, for example, if you use an infrastructure to, uh, to attack the enemy or the, the other side, like Hamas is using, for example, electricity for the rocket launching, uh, you're allowed to prevent them from having electricity on this, just, just as, a, as a point. This is the reality. I mean, we have to defend our population. We have to get back our hostages, and we have to eliminate Hamas. And we will try to minimize the harm to the civilian population. We always have. We always have, and we will always do. Mm -hmm. Now, Ambassador, coming to the ground invasion plans that Israel is having, mm -hmm. do you think by doing this you will be able to eliminate Hamas, one? And secondly, as you said, that they are spread all across the world. Uh, <coughs> how would you, you know, probably, uh, you know, address that concern? And secondly, uh, do you think that probably now is the time to give more recognition to the PLO to come to some kind of a solution? So, <coughs> I don't think that we can... I, I think we can eliminate Hamas on the ground if we go in. I, don't, I think that we cannot eliminate them if we don't come in. So it's a condition to elimination, it's coming in. And, you know, remember what Golda Meir, our Prime Minister, did after the, the, the assassination, the murder of our athletes in 72. We decided that there will not be a geographical border that will prevent us from reaching, bringing ju these people to justice. Sometimes justice is not a court, but justice. And we perse persecuted each one of them to justice. And I think that if I would be a Hamas leader now, living somewhere, I would not be comfortable in the coming future. I don't think that we are going to give up on this. Coming back to the Palestinian Authority. You know, uh, what happened, the history of Gaza is that in 2005, Ariel Sharon, our Prime Minister, decided to disengage from Gaza. What is the disengagement? We had about uh, uh, 10,000, more than 10,000 Israeli uh, civilians living inside, around, inside Gaza, and more than 20 communities. And uh, the decision was to take everyone out. At the time, it was the rule of the Palestinian Authority. They had elections soon after. Uh, Hamas won, and 
not too long after that, Hamas kicked by force, by killing, throwing uh, Palestinian Authority policemen from rooftops and such, uh, took over Gaza by, by force. And for, since then, there was no election. So unfortunately, the Palestinian Authority now is not relevant in any way in Gaza. Uh, while they are supported by us uh, in Judea and Samaria, there they are not relevant. Maybe after, there will be an, an attempt to, to make them more relevant. Um, I don't know, we will see. But for this crisis where we are standing, unfortunately, I would love to have someone strong on the other side to assume responsibility. We don't have this person or this organization. So, Ambassador, when is it that you are actually planning to move in, I mean, Israel moving in <clears throat> with a ground invasion? And at the same time, we also know the reality <clears throat> that there's another war going on. Do you think the world can afford two wars on two sides uh, going on? When we are going in, let's keep suspension in the air. I don't think that we want to to give any, any free information to our enemies, to these ISIS Hamas organizations. We will go in when we will think it's the right time to go in. Uh, speaking of other wars, it's true that the Americans, as you know, well, maybe we have to speak about the instigators of this situation. The instigators of the situation are Iran, no doubt. I don't know, because we were surprised, uh, we don't have enough information now about the planning probably of the operation. We are, learning, we are revealing more and more whether Iran was specifically involved with that. But regardless, Iran is, have been arming, training and financing Hamas for years, years. The rockets, you see the, the technology and also some of the parts come from Iran. And, uh, you mean the weaponry and all? The weaponry, yeah, the rockets that the, the, they find, uh, fire at us. So Iran is very much involved in everything happening. You can also see on the northern border of Israel, where Iran, Hezbollah, who is really a wing of uh, Iran, they are Shiites, they are the de facto rulers of Lebanon. From the time we, you know, from the attack, they started warming the border with us with clashes along the border, threatening that if we go into Gaza, they will open a front with Israel. Of course, uh, three days ago, the Iranian foreign minister went there to Beirut, met with uh, Hezbollah, with Hamas, and with Islamic Jihad. This is the, these are the people behind it. We have to remember that, and it's very important. Now, coming to your question about two wars, uh, the Americans decided to, to, near, to, to have the carriers come to the eastern Mediterranean to send a message to Iran and Hezbollah that they could, would not accept a, 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 a new front. I don't know if it will happen or not happen, but Israel, as I said before, will fight its wars by itself. We don't need any help. And I don't think that the war in Ukraine, Russia, is anything. Also, the Ukrainians are fighting their own war. I mean, they get the munition and support, and we also get support and ammunition for, uh, from our American friends mainly, but also from other friends. But this is not connected. I don't think that the two, it is connected. Unfortunately, geostrategically, you will see that people are using the war. If you ask what is the motivation of Iran, uh, you see, in the, in the last uh, few months, there are very strong talks about Israel also going, getting closer to Saudi Arabia. Yes. Before, three years ago, there was a huge change in the Middle East when we did the Abraham Accords with UAE, Bahrain, and later Morocco joined. And now there are talks about uh, uh, Saudi Arabia joining. And there were also fruits for that because there was the I2U to India involved also mm -hmm. in economic, uh, economic projects of development of everything. And even now, uh, of course, India was part of the initiative of creating a route that would come from India through uh, Gulf, Saudi Arabia, Israel to the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that these people, Iran and these Jihadist, jihadistic elements, Hamas and others, Hezbollah, are against all these moderate regimes. They are the real risk to the moderate regimes. They are against any advancement of the Middle East into peace and prosperity. They are taking us back in the very fundamentalistic religious approaches. And <clears throat> it's, a big, it's a big problem. It's a big problem. I will t tell you that I think that uh, if we... Uh, when we win the war and we eliminate Hamas, we do a great service to the region because the region is threatened by this kind and it will weaken Iran. Uh, if they make the tactical mistake and throwing Hezbollah into the fight, they are going to lose two forces they have here. This is going to be 
for them even more detrimental. I hope that they know that. We don't want a war with Hezbollah at this point. Uh, but if we are challenged there, we will come with our full force and we do have a lot of force. Mm -hmm. Well, Ambassador Israel, along with, I'm sure, the US <coughs> and UK, they've all said and accepted the fact that Hamas and Hezbollah, these are terrorist organizations. At the same time, the question that arises is, what about the Palestinians? Because end of the day, there is a Oslo Accord. I do not know if that is still dead or alive. But there is also this two-nation theory that countries, even India, believe in the State Minister of External Affairs stated it. Do you also see that still as a solution or do you think there is another solution that needs to come up after this episode? What, so what I don't is know. Israel's First point? of all, two-state solution is not in the cards now. Maybe the maximum we can speak of is three-state solution. Someone who knows the region understands that from the time that the two states were Gaza and Judea and Samaria together, now, they are not together anymore because the Palestinian Authority is in Judea and Samaria, Gaza is under Hamas. So the best we could hope for is a three-state solution. Jewish state, Palestinian Authority states in the, in the West Bank, and a, a, a Hamas state, Hamastan as we call it, in Gaza. Of course, we don't want it, yes. I do think look, the accords are still there. Uh, the reason we didn't get there, I unfortunately believe that we are not having the right partner. The last thing we want to do is create a failed state or a terror state like we have in Gaza, also in Judea and Samaria. This will be very dangerous for Israel and for Jordan because the, it will be a state that is between Jordan and Israel. So we need to have a partner, strong partner, leader, moderate anti-terror who can take assume control of the territory. We cannot create here a failed terror state. This will be terrible again, the whole story again but, of but Gaza. But who that leader could be, com I, I mean, <clears throat> looking into <throat> the current crisis and the fact that, you know, uh, there is this uh, Hamas which wants, I think it has an ambition <clears throat> to become a political party, <clears throat> but what is the kind of leader on the opposite side that you're looking at? So, I mean, there is no more a Yasser no, Arafat Hamas, living. Hamas has no ambition to become a political, they are a political party. Uh, they were, because we are going to eliminate them, but they are a political party, they are the de facto rulers uh, in Gaza, they are threatening a uh, threat to the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. Unfortunately, there is no such leader now. Abu Mazen is unable to, to be this uh, partner. Uh, I hope that in the future, we have patience, there will come the right leader on the Palestinian side. What about President Mahmoud Abbas? Abu Mazen, Mahmoud Abbas, is, mm -hmm. is, I, I don't think that he proved himself as the guy who will, has the might and the ability to unite the Palestinians into a, a viable state that is solid, stable, anti-terrorism. That's not the situation I see so far. And again, we should stay hopeful. You know, uh, things t processes take time. In Europe, just to understand, before they created the European Union, they had 400 years of wars. Life is like that, so you know, we have a hope to have stability in a political structure, be it two states, be it another structure, but to have a structure that will enable everyone to live freely and in prosperity. What it will be the structure, whether it's this or that, whether when will we have the partner, we'll wait and see. But I think that the vision and the hope is there for, on all sides. Do you think the UNSC can play a role in this? I Not individual countries? I, do, I don't think that <coughs> Security Council, I think, is... a is in, you know, uh, from the time that the main players there, the veto right, the permanent members, they are, they can agree on nothing, they cannot play a role. They, they cannot agree on anything. You know, if one says it's day, the other one will say it's night. If one will say it's war, the other side will say it's cold, just because it's, uh, you know, just because the other says. So I, I think Security Council, in a way, is paralyzed. The problem is not who will broker the deal or who, it's whether the, there is a partner that can be the trusted partner. That, is that you can say, this person, I can trust him, I know that he's anti-terror, I know that he's strong enough to unite all forces, all main forces, fight the extremists. That's what you need, and you don't have this. For the time being, I don't see this partner, but again, uh, you know, there is a generational change expected. You know, uh, Mahmoud Abbas is... Uh, 86 years old or so, I think. So, you know, uh, eventually 
maybe the next generation, maybe the generation after. But I hope that they will come back to their senses and find someone who is able to take them into better future, a better future. And uh, lastly, Ambassador, just to understand, before this war began, mm. we were seeing a lot of political instability happening in Israel itself. Do you think, considering those tensions kind of remain, you will mm. be able to go in uh, and address this additional challenge? There is no doubt. Our enemies misread our debates. We are very much divided. We are divided on questions of... Uh, of, of how liberal the state has to be, how conservative, how strong the court should be. These are debates that every democratic country has. Like our biggest mistake was un not understanding that Hamas does not think like us. We thought that since we have deterrence against Hamas and since there we in the last couple of years enabled tens of thousands daily, tens of thousands of their population come to Israel, make money, take back money and there was relative prosperity, it will be a deterrence for them from starting war. Because we thought that they think like us, that what is good, like a, you know, a responsible party, what is good for my population. This is not a calculation. And the same mistake the, the, the other side is doing when it comes to Israel. They see democracy, they don't, they don't understand the concept of democracy, of liberal, of fighting. The fact that we fight and argue on things internally, it's not weakness. Of course, it's not healthy, but it's not weakness. It's, it's strength. It's an open, vibrant society. And the mistake is that they give us, gave us, they reminded us what is important in life. Everything was pushed aside. Everyone is united. You see, you know, people from both sides, the more liberal and more conservative, they're uniting, going together to the military. I just uploaded and I saw another video of the Fauda actors. You know, people know Fauda from Netflix as a serious, uh, you know, all, all three stars, uh, male stars, are really combat soldiers by yes. experience. They all went, some volunteered because they are over age also. They went and volunteered, everyone volunteers. Whoever is drafted into the military, like one of my sons and my daughter is serving in military service, uh, went to military. And whoever was over age was not called to reserve, whatever. You, you have to see the civil society organized in order to help the soldiers, to support them, to bring them equipment that they need, food, the love and the uni unity. Israel is like, it's like a fist. Once you, you put a threat from outside, we unite and it's very hard to split us. And they made, I think they made a terrible mistake with starting with us and, and doing such atrocities because we, they left us no choice. Usually we would avoid going into severe situations that we don't need to. But they left us no choice because we understand that this is from the Holocaust. The Jews never had such atrocities. It's the, it's the worst we ever had. And we understand that we have to eliminate the capacity to do that in the future. But what about the questions that are being raised on the capability of Israeli military and the intelligence? How did they mm -hmm. come in and, and all those mm -hmm. things? So. Clearly, there were failures. There is no doubt. No one will deny that. Uh, we are very good in checking ourselves, but this will be done after we stop our mission. Now we have a mission. Uh, we have to be united in the mission and start arguing about what went wrong. But I, as I said before, I mentioned it, and our biggest misperception is that we thought that we have Hamas as a rational... We, we looked at Hamas in our glasses as a rational player ruler of Gaza, which have an interest in preserving good life, minimal, rel relative, good level of living for the population. And that was a huge, huge mistake. They have no interest whatsoever in their population. They have an, an extreme jihadist ideology that they want to execute. And if you look at people from your perspective, you think that they are like you, they are not like you. Uh, I think that this made many other failures. The biggest failure, there were warning signs, but we tended to look at them as, no, it cannot be, they are deterred, and they, uh, they ha we improved their lives now, we allowed people to come and work in Israel, surely they will not, not want, it's only, you know, they only exercise, they don't want to attack us, uh, but uh, again, uh, it happens from time to time, these failures, and I'm sure that we are very strong and innovative, and are able to uh, overcome and learn the lesson for the future 
And Ambassador, just before I close, do you expect India to play the role of a mediator? Again, I, I, I think... Do you think it has the capacity also to do so? I think that, at least from the Israeli point of view, India is a very, very trusted ally. And uh, I, I said also before, maybe, uh, you know, the fact that India came out and unequivocally uh, denounced um, Prime Minister against this buys India the right to also speak about other issues. There are people who come now and speak about uh, the humanitarian situation in Gaza. But I always say, you know, if you didn't speak about the uh, animal behavior, vicious, barbaric murdering of 1,400 uh, women, children, uh, and elderly Israelis, when it happened, you did not buy the, the right to speak now about the humanitarian issue in uh, Gaza. Because it means that someone who didn't denounce that is supporting terrorism. There is no other explanation no, to But it. then before that, there had been killings on Palestinians too. We've been seeing the incidents on Al-Aqsa Mosque and other things. This is exactly where the mistake is. Because you cannot, you, you cannot it's, not, it's not the same. Because terror is terror is terror. If you try to bring perspective into terrorism, you are supporting terrorism. Because if you are trying to bring, ah, yes, it's a reaction to, no. Coming at 6.30 in the morning in a holiday, butchering women, children, cutting their heads, raping, is not justified. There is nothing that justifies that. And trying to put it in context is supporting terrorism, justifying terrorism. Terrorism is not justified in any way. There is no any context, there is no any justification. Terror is terror is terror, and we will eliminate this terror. And any attempt to try and dress it differently means that people are not honest and are not against terrorism. They just have an, a pro approach to the other side, and they're trying now to explain why you have to understand the other side. Because there are civilians involved in this. Again, this, is this kind of atrocities. Did anyone go and justify ISIS? Did, did you ask this question when ISIS uh, decapitated people, raped women, took them as, as sex slaves, and I don't know what? Did anyone say, oh, maybe ISIS, you know, for a long time they were uh, mistreated and they were... Uh, no, no one says it, and no one should say this about our, our Hamas ISIS. It's exactly the same. They crossed the line. You know, here and there attacking, okay, let's say, but doing this level of atrocity, it cannot be justified. And people who did not denounce it immediately when it happened, lost in my eyes the moral standing to speak about humanitarian now. This, this is my approach at least. Ambassador, thank you very much for talking to us. And I know it's a very difficult time, won't take much time of yours. So that was Ambassador of Israel to India, Mr. Naur Gilon, talking to us about the ongoing crisis and what might uh, lay ahead in terms of this issue that has now engulfed the entire world. With Naman Mehra on camera, this is Naini Basu for ABP Live.